It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. This week, the Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Scott Pruitt announced that the Trump administration intends to roll back the most important environmental and economic policies of our times, the Clean Power Plan. The CPP, as it is known, was to reduce national electricity sector emissions by an estimated 32 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. The CPP was the cornerstone of the United States' adherence to the Paris Climate Agreement under President Obama. However, the Trump administration's withdrawal from both the Paris Agreement and from the Clean Power Plan is expected to be more complicated than Pruitt or Trump would like to admit. For one thing, an announcement of intent is insufficient in the case of the EPA canceling the CPP. That would mean that there will be hearings, a public comment period, and most likely a legal battle. Joining us now to discuss what is at stake here is Robert Polan. He is a distinguished professor of economics and the co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the author of several books, including Greening the Global Economy, and he is also the co-author of a recently authored article in the American Prospect titled A Just Transition for U.S. Fossil Fuel Industry. Bob, it's good to have you with us. Thank you very much, Sharmini. So, Bob, the clean energy sector is the biggest and the fastest growing energy sector in the U.S. Tell us about the Clean Power Plan and how it was supposed to work. And in your opinion, was the CPP a potentially effective proposal for reducing emissions and to fight this runaway climate uh, change we are faced with? Well, you know, the, the, the Clean Power Plant uh, proposal was, as you said, the single most important measure introduced under the Obama administration in the area of regulation. I would argue that, uh, you know, Obama made uh, enormous contributions as part of the stimulus program in 2009 in terms of uh, promoting clean energy investments, but that's, that's past history. The clean power plant, as you said, the aim was to reduce emissions, CO2 emissions, by 32 percent by 2030. That's good. That's good. That is actually fairly modest relative to what is needed in order to get close to a real climate stabilization goal. Uh, nevertheless, it was an important step in the right direction. Now, if we do not go through with it, let's say it's a total disaster in terms of any kind of climate stabilization policy, because it's not like we can go on forever not trying to stabilize the climate. Every year that goes by that we don't take sufficient action makes it ever more difficult to ever get to any climate stabilization goal. Right. And, uh, Bob, the effect uh, CPP would have had on employment when it's fully uh, implemented, especially employment in the renewable energy sector, so-called green jobs, um, give us a sense of what that may have looked like under CPP. The basic point is that investing in clean energy, meaning investing in renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal, uh, small-scale hydro, um, and energy efficiency, so that we don't consume so much energy, we can run on less energy. Investing in those areas is an enormous source of job creation relative to maintaining our fossil fuel economy. I've done studies on this now for a decade, including for the Obama administration. What we found consistently is that gen investing in green energy generates about three times more jobs per dollar of expenditure than maintaining our fossil fuel economy. So as a source of job creation, a green growth path is a powerful engine of job opportunity. Now, the problem, of course, 
is it obviously is not a source of job opportunity for people who have jobs in the fossil fuel sector, such as coal miners. Obviously, those jobs have to go away. But those jobs can be handled by giving, creating, as you, thank you for mentioning the article I wrote, and I'm doing other studies on that now, on what we call a just transition for fossil fuel sector workers, meaning that fossil fuel sector workers should have guaranteed jobs uh, in other areas, uh, re-employment, retraining, uh, relocation, the communities need reinvestment. That has to be part of the equation as well. And in fact, Obama had uh, proposed such a measure that was supported at, towards the end of his presidency by most Republicans because it would benefit people in the coal sector, in the coal industry, and in those regions. Mitch McConnell was against it because anything that Obama was for, he was against. Now, keep in mind, total number of people working in coal, including everybody, not just the miners, everybody in coal in the United States now is about 66,000 people. 66,000, our labor force is 150 million. The people in coal represent five one-hundredths of all jobs. We can easily find ways to get these people in the coal industry over time into better situations. That's what a just transition is about. And just transition is critical in order to make this green power transition something that is favorable all around. Now, Bob, do we have a measure of how many jobs are being created in the green jobs sector in comparison? Yeah, so if we, if we were to spend a million dollars in uh, green energy, uh, on average, you get 16 jobs. When you spend a million dollars on fossil fuels, including coal, natural gas, and oil, you get five jobs. Five jobs versus 16 jobs, meaning you get three times more jobs per dollar of expenditure by investing in clean energy. But even that, that three to one ratio, understates the relative benefits. Because what really would happen, and is happening, is we are investing in clean energy now, which is creating the jobs, and the job losses that will take place over time in the fossil fuel sector are going to get spread out over 20 years. So it's not like for every new job we create in clean energy, we lose one in fossil fuel energy. So I've done, been doing studies for the state of New York, the state of Washington. The number of people who actually are going to lose their jobs per year in either of those states is less than 100 people after we account for people that will be going into retirement. So it's easy to come up with a just transition plan, as I tried to argue in that American Prospect article. Right. Bob, now let's turn to what the Trump administration is saying in terms of why they want to withdraw from the clean power plan. Uh, so Pruitt, in the press release he uh, issued, says, the Trump administration estimates the proposed repeal could provide up to $33 billion in avoided compliance costs in 2030. If true, what does this mean, and who would avoid the $33 billion in costs, and who would, lose from, uh, who would lose that revenue? Look, here's th this is from the, the official Department of Energy, Energy Information Agency. Even under Trump, and I hope they keep putting out factual uh, reports, right now, if you were to try to set up a... Um, electricity, electrical generating utility using renewable energy, uh, solar, wind, um, geothermal, hydro, uh, versus doing it with coal, um, or nuclear, actually. This is from the Department of Energy. You are at cost parity or lower costs with green energy versus non-renewable, fossil fuel or nuclear. It is the costs are lower. OK, so we are not there are no costs in after we, of course, undergo the transition. There are no net costs. The cost of, of buying electricity for consumers will be roughly the same or lower. So this is coming from the Department of Energy. This isn't coming from me. 
the Department of Energy's own results. So there are no net costs. There are net benefits, obviously, as I said, in terms of jobs. But the most fundamental net benefit is we've got to do something about climate. We've got to do something to stabilize the climate. We really don't have a whole lot of time in order to do this. And the Clean Power Plan was an important, though inadequate, step in the right direction. Right. Now, before Trump came to office, and this has been documented by the New York Times, in fact, he signed off on a, a full-page ad by CEOs of the country um, asking for the U.S. to sign on to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement and uh, President Trump's um, <clears throat> uh, name appears in this ad. This is before he started running for office. Now, obviously, this is something he agreed uh, a while back. Now it's not so convenient. So who is benefiting from this repeal? Well, the people that are benefiting are the people that own fossil fuel assets, oil companies, coal companies, natural gas. Uh, there's really nobody else. I mean, yes, of course, the uh, communities, the workers, uh, they are affected. We, we have to take that seriously. So that's why, as I mentioned, I'm doing a study now uh, with a coalition in the state of New York. I'm doing another study with a, a very progressive union coalition in the state of Washington, which really takes this idea of just transition quite seriously, because there will be people hurt. And what Trump and his administration are exploiting is the fact that there will be short-term transition costs and there will be uh, really damage done to people and communities unless we have a just transition. But the point is it's not hard to enact and uh, implement a just transition. This has to be part of the overall plan. And once we have that, the idea of just transition integrated into a green growth strategy, then we, then the Trumpites can't make the argument that, oh, we don't care about coal workers, we don't care about their communities. Uh, we do care about their communities, and we care about their communities, and we care about everybody else's communities. That's why a green growth, a green energy plan with just transition is the only way to go. And by the way, if we don't do this, if we don't enact a green growth, what's going to happen is happening is that China is going to completely dominate the clean energy market for the next generation. Uh, and we will have fewer jobs because we'll be importing solar p uh, plants and wind turbines uh, from China. Right. And Bob, you know, we've tackled this issue uh, in previous interviews we've done. For people who are in the fossil fuel sector, it's difficult for them to imagine a just transition. Um, and particularly for the Trump base, you know, uh, there's a tendency to gravitate to, you know, coal and keeping coal jobs, which is obviously unhealthy and not good for the environment and not good for your bodies. So give us a sense of how this just transition transition works? How do, how do we actually transition people who are working in the fossil fuel industry now? Okay, so, you know, as I said, and I, I shouldn't give too many details now because we have these studies coming out, and hopefully we can, I'll come back on, we can discuss them when the studies come out. But there are groups, uh, really, uh, really committed coalitions that include labor unions, uh, environmental groups, community groups. That, are work, that have worked on these things quite seriously, and I'm a resource person for them. So what would a just transition look like? Uh, first of all, you know, we, we look at the, the workers who are involved, and we say, okay, uh, the first set of workers that we're thinking about are the workers who are near retirement age, uh, old folks like me. So those people, we are saying, uh, we will get you uh, a uh, income guarantee into retirement and a pension guarantee subsequent to that. So those are critical things. Now, what about the people that are not uh, in their 60s or close to their 60s? Uh, how many jobs do we need to create? Well, as I said, in the coal, uh, in the whole country, there's 66,000 people. If we basically, so we say, you know, some of them are going to move towards retirement. So we say there's 50,000 total. And of those, uh, you know, we're talking about 
a contraction of the industry over time. So we're looking at maybe something like 5,000 people per year that we have to place into new jobs. It can be done. It's easy to do that. 5,000 people in a labor market of 150 million. So we have to commit to getting these people new jobs, and we have to say that those jobs that they get uh, will have wages uh, at least at the level of their current jobs. And on top of that, communities. The communities will contract. There will be cost to the communities in terms of contraction, but we have to also realize that there are new clean energy investments coming in, so we need to channel a relatively high share of the new clean energy jobs into the regions where we have high impact. Those are the key elements of a just transition that we've worked out. All right, Bob, we're looking forward to the studies you're working on uh, to shed more light on certain people so that people can imagine um, what a new green economy looks like. So I wish you all the best with that and look forward to having you back to talk about it. Thank you for having me on, Charmaine. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.